voice of the modern archtop guitar. New York kind of adopted the guitar uh, in many ways. And to have had individual makers coming from Europe, Italy namely, setting up their shops in New York and producing instruments that really came from their heritage. Brawling communities of transplanted people. There was a lot of community support. It really took root and grew into what it is what we know of it today. It's also perhaps the greatest city for all the music that is associated, the recording industry and performance, live performance and otherwise. New York is the mecca for all of these things to happen. When did you start making guitars? It was kind of a crazy idea, it was wild, but I, I looked at Santo and Johnny's album cover. When Sleepwalk hit, that was a very big hit uh, at the time. Something called Sleepwalk, ladies and gentlemen. Santo and Johnny. I really wanted to make the F-hole guitar, or I wanted to have one at least. That was an impossibility. But this other thing was a slab of wood with strings on it. I said, now, nah, that I can do. My uncle was very much into music, and so I would listen to the recordings that he had. Gene Autry, well, the Cowboys had F. Hall Arch Top guitars. This was the American thing. This was the American sound. And the instruments really were American. Yeah. The development of all this was American. I mean, I grew up listening to my father with a string quartet, and to me, violins and chills was such a normal mm -hmm. thing. How do you get involved in, in arch tops? Well, the arch top guitar I'd known about, I, I would hear it, but I always liked the mandolin. I always had a fascination for it. The biggest mandolin that everyone wanted to have was the, uh, the F5 Lloyd Laura Gibson from about 1922 to 24. Exactly. And that was my model to build my mandolins on. I was making copies of the, F the, of the F5. Wow. There was always an independent luthier back, even in Orville Gibson's day. There was somebody working out of their garage or their basement who was trying to make a copy of that or something just yeah. like it. That period that Lloyd Lore was associated with Gibson was very, very important for the instrument. The development of the instrument, the refinement of uh, particular aspects to the construction of the instrument. So that was my entry into the, into the world of mandolin, but it was also into the world of the archtop carved instruments. For the guitars would follow that later. In the back of my mind, I, I would hear that sound. So that by the time I saw my first Angelica, which I was 12 years old. Oh my God. Tell me about that moment. I would work at my father's shop, uh, even as a boy. You know, in summertime, I would spend my time working at the shop and making plaster lamps. The doors would be open in the summertime and traffic would come passing through. And I knew this one guy who would drive in all the time and I could see he was a guitar player. He'd pull out a case. He pulls it out and he puts the case on the ground, he opens it up, and sure enough inside is a brand new New Yorker. I thought that was just magic, you know? It was magical, yeah. <laughs> there he is, Mr. D'Angelico. And then he closed the case and uh, I didn't see a D'Angelico for a while after that. John D'Angelico, when you pick up one of his instruments, you can feel a combination of these American icons, his ethnicity that comes through. But beyond that, you can also feel something that is hand built. You can tell there is a passion with it. You can feel it, you can hear it. I think that he understood how to take it to the next level as a, a personal association of the instrument and the musician. Jimmy Acquisto's legacy comes from John's legacy as a, an apprentice in his shop. After his passing, Jimmy was left to sink or swim in a way. 
and prove himself. Personally, I, I was self-taught. I had to know how this was done or that was done. It was, I guess, by luck that I got to get exposed to the instruments of every level of quality you could imagine. I got a very, very deep education from that. These days, a luthier to acquire that kind of information is a lot more difficult. They're just not exposed commonly to a lot of the collector's value instruments that I was commonly exposed to. I'm always learning every day, still to this day. Should I try this? Should I try that? Maybe I can get a little more brilliance out of this. Maybe some more sustain off of that. You know, you're tapping and evaluating pieces of wood as you're going along. I'm in an environment where it's very quiet. I listen to the materials. I can hear them. That will affect the outcome of the instrument. What I like about America is the openness of acceptance. You can do anything you want, basically, here in America. And I always like that for an artist. And creativity really is a natural element. It's a human element that needs to be fed to be expressive, to express ourselves. And what could be better than a guitar to express themselves? You know, or any musical instrument, really, but we know them as guitars.